Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Pastor James, and I'm glad that you're watching this video. Let me ask you to please click on the share button below. Now that I've said that little introduction, let me just tell you that nothing I'm going to say from this point on is easy to say. And I pray that you would afford me some grace, allow me to stumble over my words, but I would also ask, I would also ask you to listen to my heart. So I want to talk about a subject that is um, important to the people of God. And I believe it will encourage and strengthen and cause your relationship with God to grow. When I first went to college years ago, I was introduced to a Greek word called agape. This word means love in Greek. But it didn't take long before I realized that there was another word in Greek also that means love. It's called phylos. We get the word Philadelphia from it. So I already found out that in Greek there's two words that mean love. When much longer, I learned that there was a third word, eros, which means we get the word erotic from. It's more of a central type of love. Once again, three words in Greek that all mean love. And sometimes it's these nuances or these, uh, these small differences that help us to understand the exact meaning of something to the fullest. However, in English, we use the word love to describe so many different things. You love your mom and dad. And I do. You, you love your wife. And I do. I love my dogs. And I do. And I love Oreo cookies. And I do. Think about how we use the word love. We use it to say that I love God and also that I love this TV show. Or that I love my children. I love my little baby. But also I love Seinfeld. It's just seems odd to use such a word to encapsulate the area of your faith and the reason for living as well as your life mate and partner that you've been with for for decades but also a show that you just discovered on Netflix or a sport that you just started watching to use the same word and we do that we use a broad brush but as you can as I mentioned in Greek there's three different words that mean love well I want to talk about praise today and this is the part that may make you feel uncomfortable and myself as well. Because we know that praise is a quintessential aspect to the Christian life, to the God-fearing life and to the grateful life of one who realizes what, that, what the Creator has done in your life. So what does it mean to praise God? You know, we will get something in the mail and we might say, well, praise the Lord. We're glad or ecstatic that maybe we didn't have to pay a bill or we didn't or the test result from the doctor uh, came back negative or positive, depending on what you were looking for. We use this expression, praise the Lord, or hallelujah, or sweet Jesus, or whatever it is that comes to our mind. But what does it mean to praise the Lord? And does God want us to be, let me ask this way, does God want us to be ignorant of what it is to praise Him, how we can praise Him, and not only that, how we should praise Him? And so I want to look at the word praise. And there are, just like in Greek, there are nuances of this word. And I want to speak about one of the nuances. I believe that there's seven different words, words for praise in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. But I'm going to look at one of them today. If you're wondering where I'm getting this from today, there's a book, oh, I done messed it up, by Chris Tomlin and Darren Whitehead. It's called Holy Roar. You can get this on the Kindle. It's seven words that will cause a change to the way you worship. I want to, want to talk about that aspect today. To change how we are living or how we can live. If you're not interested in your growth in the Lord, I can promise you that this rest of the words I have to say will not interest you. However, if there's a desire in your heart to say, Lord, I want to go deeper in Christ Jesus. I want to know more about what my faith offers to me that I would encourage you to listen on, read on, and study on. The Lord has much for those that are hungry. And if you're hungry for more in the Lord, I want to offer you something more. Something more that I want even in my own life. And I'm a minister, so take that with the take that for as it's, for what it's worth. I told you I'd stumble over my words today. So to praise the Lord. I'm going to choose uh, Psalm 67 and verse 3. 
Why do I say choose? Because this word is used 111 times in this tense alone, and well over 160 times in the, in the Old Testament in various forms of that, of that main root word. So let me look at this, Psalm 67, verse 3. Let the peoples praise you. O God, let the peoples praise you. This word here, we see it in English, we hear the word praise, and we think that's it, praise. But what does that word mean? I'll try to throw it up on the screen here. It's a word that's spelled Y-A-D-A-H. Y-A-D-A-H. And it has little marks over the A's. I believe it might be pronounced yada or yada. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, yada. But this word means this, to revere or worship with extended hands, to hold out the, the, to hold out the hand or to throw a stone or an arrow. You can look this up yourself if you don't believe me or if you question it. I would direct you to many commentaries, but one in particular, look at the uh, Concise Dictionary of Words in the Greek and Hebrew Bible, Volume 2 by James Strong's. You've probably heard of uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It's just your kind of your run-of-the-mill Greek and Hebrew dictionary. But this is found in many other dictionaries as well, as, as well as BDAG and some of the other ones. So let us look at this word, and let me just say that this is scholarly done. I am not making this up. This word praise here is indicated that there seems to be a gesture that goes with it. A raising of the hands, a shooting up of the hands to say, praise the Lord. There is an outward, there's an outward expression of the inward praising of God. And that's what I want to talk about today. My desire is not to turn you into something that you're not, but my desire is to ask you, is what you are fully actualized according to Scripture? Or have we found a way to hide in the woods of a denomination or of a congregation? What am I saying? You might say, well, we don't do that at my church. I understand. Or we don't do that as name off the denomination, as a Methodist or as Episcopalian or as a, as a Baptist or whatever. And we all have had those stories, and I will tell you mine. I was saved in a Southern Baptist church, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, came down front, asked the Lord to save my soul. And I attended that church for six months. I enjoyed the singing, enjoyed the sermons. I was growing by leaps and bounds. But I was invited to another church during a revival time, and I went, and things were a little bit different. You probably have experienced it. Have you ever been in one of those churches or been in one of those services where slowly during the service, maybe during the singing, someone raises their hands? How'd that make you feel? Let me ask you this question. Do you feel confident or comfortable doing it right now in your own life, in your own church? Just simply slip up a hand. It seems like a small thing to do. It seems like so easy, but yet there seems to be such a hardship to do that. But the scripture here, this word yada, tells us that this is a, a praising of the Lord. Let the whole earth praise the Lord, but not just simply like praise him as you sit on your hands, but praise him with the uplifted hands. When I first went to that church, again, seeing people uh, raise their hands, I would look around like, oh, what's that? What's all that about? I felt awkward and I felt uncomfortable. Would that describe you today? I would say maybe many of you feel that way. I could never do that, you might say. Why would I want to do that? That's just not my personality. Oh, I go to a different church. We don't do that. We don't express ourselves that way. Whatever it might be, I want to say that there are many reasons why we may not do something. But I want to ask you, is that truly the way that God wants you to be in your spirit? Is that truly the way that he's outlined in his scripture? I've always heard people tell me this. I go, what kind of church you go to? I go to a Bible-believing church. Would you say that today? I go to a Bible-believing church. Well, the passage I'm reading today from, from Psalm 67 verse 3 is in the Bible. 
And that word there, yada, is in the Bible. And it means to praise the Lord with an extended hands, to, with uplifted hands. And it says to like throw a stone or to, uh, or to cast away from yourself, to shoot an arrow. Meaning something that is close to your being is now coming out from your being. Whether you're throwing a stone going away from you or an arrow that is on a bow and you launch it and it goes away from you. There is a praise that is within us. A glorious hallelujah because of what God has done in our heart and in our soul. And there are times, there can be and there should be times, that expression wants to leave us. Now, I know that you may think, Pastor, you just don't know my personality. Well, let me ask you this. Who defines how our personality should be? I've seen many people that would probably would say I, I could never do that. But I've been to ball games and I've watched them yell at the referee when he called a bad play. I've seen, him, seen them yell at the referee when they called a good play. I've seen them throw up their hands like when there's a touchdown or when the game buzzing shot is made. I've seen them cheer on visibly and even with hands pumped when they score a touchdown or around the bases. It seems that in other areas of our life where our heart is engaged, our passion is engaged, there's an expression that comes out. The high fives, the jumping up and down, the excitement. You can watch any sporting game when it's a close game, especially among rivalries, when one team scores or when a penalty is called and there's yelling or there's booing on the field or there's cheering. We can see those expressions and we never think twice about it. We never look around and go, oh no, what if I cheer? What, if I, what are the other people going to say? What if I say, boo ref, or are they going to get mad at me? If I say, if I give them a high five when there's a touchdown, are they going to look at me weird? We, we never think that way. But somehow we've allowed it to come into our churches and tell us how we should and should not praise the Lord. The reason why I want to address this is because this is something that I think liberates the believer, allows the believer to be more and I guess to be as we ought to be in the Lord. That as we are full of the Lord, we'll find that expression coming out in our life. In the videotape or in this book here, Chris Tomlin is talking about his conservative background, how he was never raised going to any of those types of church. He was considered a conservative. They didn't do those kinds of things. And he found that when he began to change the music in his car from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Black Eyed Peas or whatever else he was listening to, and listening to praise music in his car, he found himself beginning to change in his heart. You know how it is when you listen to music. How many of you, how many of you have ever played the air drum set? You know what I'm talking about when you're listening to a, a piece by Rush or maybe something like a Jukebox Hero by Foreigner. And there's that, there's that drum thing and you're doing this in the car. You're just beating to it because it sounds so good. Or even moving your head to the beat. Or how many times have you heard something, some guitar riff by, by Guns N' Roses or by Dire Straits and you find yourself doing the air guitar. We find ourselves invested in what we're listening to. Chris Tomlin said after listening to praise music in his car, he found that there was this, this excitement that was being expressed. And he found that it's because his heart was being full of praising to God and there became what was natural, a lifting of the hands. Just like the air guitar or the, or the beating of the drums, there's an expression that is deep in the heart of a man, deep in the heart of the woman that wants to praise God. And hallelujah, the Hebrew language gives us Minutia. It gives us that degree how we can do it. It says, praise the Lord. But how? And the Hebrew writer would say, with lifting your hands up. That's how you can begin praising the Lord. Lift up your hands, lift up your voice, and praise the Lord. You know, there's that psalm here, and I guess I should look it up. Let us go to Psalm 150, and I'll close with this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. 
Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the resounding cymbals or the sounding cymbals. Praise him with the loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How might we praise the Lord? This would say yada, by lifting up your hands. The lifting up of hands, and I want to say categorically, is not owned by any particular denomination. It is not a Pentecostal thing. It is not a Baptist thing. It is not a Methodist thing. It is a Christian or a, a lover of God thing. We praise our hands because God said we can do it. And I want to say when we don't do it, we minimize. We steal from ourselves the joy that we could have if we would allow ourselves to engage with God. And so this is the text today. And so let me ask you, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? Let me encourage you. Praise the Lord. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord cover you with his grace and his majesty. May you praise him. Amen.